Good afternoon. Dear ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to the session Prevention of Maternal Child Transmission, Maternal Health and Elimination of Pediatric HIV AIDS. My name is Ruslan Maluta and uh, I work with UNICEF in Eastern Europe and Central Asia region as PMTST Pediatric HIV AIDS Advisor. I will co-chair this session together with my colleague, Dr. In Rulo, from World Health Organization in Switzerland. Today we have a panel of four outstanding scientists and public health professionals. Dr. James McIntyre, Dr. Nathan Schaffer, Dr. Gabriel Fisher, and Dr. Nigel Rawlings. As you may have already heard from previous presentation during this conference, a significant progress has been made in delivering prevention of mother child transmission globally uh, in, the, in the low and middle income countries. More than 1.5 million of pregnant women were benefited from PMTST intervention in 2008. However, much work remains to be done. More than 400,000 children were newly infected with HIV in 2008. The vast majority through mother to child transmission. The new 2010 WHO recommendations for antiretroviral treatment of pregnant women, PMTCT, and infant feeding provide an important new opportunity and public health approach to implement highly effective intervention in resource limited settings and promote health for both mother and child. In non breastfeeding population, the risk of mother to child transmission can be reduced to less than 2% and less than 5% in breastfeeding populations. Major gaps and obstacles are need to be overcome to achieve this. These are also challenges of health-related Millennium Development Goals. Many women give birth without a single antenatal visit and outside healthcare facility. Maternal and infant mortality in many countries remain unacceptable high. Scaling up PMTCT coverage and reaching the goal of elimination of mother child transmission should go together with strengthening and improvement of maternal child health platform. We need to better understand and improve, we need to better understand and do, for, uh, why women don't att attend antenatal care and deliver a child without getting assistance from qualified professionals. We need to identify early enough high-risk pregnancies to prevent mother-to-child transmission, infant and maternal mortality. We need to change the attitude of society and health communities towards HIV-positive women and their children. Elimination of mother-to-child transmission and reduction of infant and maternal mortality in countries with concentrated epidemic will not be possible unless enhancing inequality of services and better outreach to marginalized and most at-risk women. Pregnant women who use street drugs often tend to be missed by antenatal delivery, care, and PMTCT services. Programs need to be tailored to meet their needs and go beyond clinical care and should include a range of social support and protection issues, both in health institutions and in the community. Today, we have funding and operational mechanism. We have leadership to build AIDS-free generation. Target of elimination of mother child transmission by 2015 are agreed by major stakeholders and governments. Together, we could hit this call and make it real. With this, I would like to move the microphone to our first speaker, Dr. James McIntyre from Anova Health Institute from South Africa. James McIntyre is an executive director of Anova Health Institute in Johannesburg and, uh, in the, international, is, as, and the international vice chair of the U.S. National Institutes for Health-Funded International Maternal Pediatric and Adolescent AIDS Clinical Trials Network, the leading global col collaborative network on HIV in women and children. Dr. McIntyre previously worked for 25 years in the Chris Henney Barakwan Hospital in Soweto, where he was the co-founder and the executive director of the Paranal HIV Research Unit. Dr. McIntyre, please. Thank you very much and congratulations for finding your way through to this room. I'm not entirely sure what background music we'll get, but I'm sure it'll be appropriate. 
as the slides change. And I do need to point out, of course, that I must have started work very, very young in Soweto to have done it for 25 years. I'm going to try and, and contextualize before we, we get into some of the, the more detailed presentations, just where, we're, where I think we stand with regard to HIV and the Millennium Development Goals, particularly four and five, to reduce child mortality and to improve maternal health. And I really think that if we're serious about addressing MDGs four and five, we also have to realize that MDG six, and particularly the, the combating of HIV and AIDS, is uh, completely central to achieving these goals, and especially in the countries of, of highest prevalence. So if we look at the scale of the problems, we know that there are 33 million or more people living with AIDS globally, two million dying, and nearly three million newly infected in 2008. We know that nine million children die in the developing world every year, and that about two-thirds of these deaths are from preventable causes. And we know that um, around half a million mothers, although recent data suggests that this is dropping, um, die uh, from complications of pregnancy or childbirth. And if you look at this, and, and I love these maps from World Mapper because they, they just, for me, visual, help me visualize what's going on. This is the map that shows you what the size of the continents would be if they were in proportion to the thing that we're looking at. So if you look at world population in general, you can see that Africa, for instance, has relatively few people. India has a very large population, and so it would become bigger. But if we now do that for infant mortality, maternal mortality, and HIV, you can see the areas of overlap. So infant mortality and maternal mortality are exactly the problems in the same places where HIV is a problem. And so WHO's four prongs that we've heard about throughout the conference and which remain the mainstay of our, of our approach to this become really important for addressing both four, five, and six of the Millennium Development Goals. And we've made progress. We have undoubtedly made progress. You've seen this slide. Um, you've heard it mentioned. We've seen coverage rise from around 10 to 15 percent in 2003, 2004, up to above 45 percent, and in East and Southern Africa to 58 percent. But we don't often see the reverse of this slide. We don't see the number of people who are not getting ARVs that they need in pregnancy and that remains probably more than half of women. We do have this remarkable increase in treatment. We've seen treatment across the globe extend in, by millions, and that will have some impact on what we're talking about. We have the statements from, from our leading um, international agencies and politicians. There is no reason why a mother should die of AIDS. There is no cause for any child to be born with HIV. We can virtually eliminate and so we're hearing a lot of the eliminate word. We're hearing eradicate around mother's child transmission. And I think that that's a wonderful goal. It worries me a little bit that we're almost perceiving that because we say we can do it, it's done. And I don't think it is done. It worries me to some extent that PMTCT is going down the agenda of, uh, of all of our industry here to the extent that uh, you've been relegated to this tiny room in a, in a tucked away hot corner. But um, I, I think that we can move towards that. But I do think that there are some things that we have to recognize have to be done. So let's talk about appropriate treatment and care. PMTCT services now should be gateways to treatment. Women who need treatment should start it as soon as possible in pregnancy. We've just seen more data again for this conference around that. And we have to recognize that HIV is an underestimated so far cause of maternal mortality. This is from this recent article in uh, The Lancet that shows what's happened to maternal mortality since 1980. And if you take the non-HIV causes, you can see this quite dramatic decline. We are having an effect on reducing maternal mortality. But what is keeping it up, um, it, although there's some decline from here, what is keeping it higher than it should be is the HIV effect. And if we look at my own country in South Africa where we have a confidential inquiry into maternal deaths, if we look at that data from 2002 to 2007, non-pregnancy related infections were the most common cause of death in the first triennium, 37.8, accounted for 46% of deaths between 2004 and 2007, and AIDS was the single biggest cause of death of mothers, 22% higher than any direct obstetric cause. 
And if you look at this data of institutional maternal mortality, you can see that the maternal mortality rate in HIV negatives was one-tenth of the maternal mortality rate in HIV positives. So I think that that shows the, exactly their interaction. But I think we shouldn't forget about TB. HIV and TB are both independent risk factors for maternal mortality. TB is more common in young women in high-prevalence HIV settings in Africa than in older men or in older women. A South African study showed a tenfold higher TB incidence in HIV-infected versus HIV-uninfected mothers. And maternal mortality in this study was 121 0.7 per, th per thousand with co-infection compared to 38.5 with TB alone. So I think it just a reminder that we have to do that. Koresha, Karim and, and colleagues recently published this in The Lancet to say that reducing maternal mortality in women with HIV will also require improvements in antenatal care and obstetric services as well as specific attention to the management of conditions that are aggravated by underlying HIV infection. And I want to say something about the need for treatment compared to the need for prophylaxis. And Elaine Abrahams referred to this data again this morning in her plenary. But I think it really helps us to focus our mind. This is data from Louise Kuhn and colleagues from the ZEB study in Zambia. And it's based on just over 1,000 women who they had follow-up to 24 months. And if you take a CD4 count of less than 350, our current entry point to ARV treatment in the guidelines that we'll hear about, you can see that in this study, 54% of women, of, preg of these pregnant women, would have qualified for ART under, under that condition. If we add in the clinical staging, it goes up to 68%. So I think that that's again a reality call to say when we talk about providing antiretrovirals to women who need them in pregnancy, it may be a large number. But it pays off. And that's shown here by the proportion of transmission and the maternal mortality broken out by those um, categories. So in those eligible for ART uh, by CD4 or clinical, you can see those women made up 87% of the transmission, both by six weeks and after six weeks, and 92% of the maternal deaths. Whereas those fewer women who were not yet eligible for ART were at much lower risk, contributing only 12.5% of transmission from the third of them who met that criterion, and only 8% of maternal deaths. So getting women on treatment, whether it's 30% or 60% in our services, those women who require treatment remain an urgent priority that we need to address. We know that those who, for those who don't yet require treatment, they should be receiving the best possible prophylactic regimen, and Nathan will go through the new guidelines. But I think we also need to acknowledge that in this day and age, in 2010, single-dose nevirapine with breastfeeding that is unprotected by antiretroviral prophylaxis is not an appropriate PMTCT strategy other than in emergency settings. It's time to move on. And moving on, we are. This is another slide from Elaine Abrams that shows the use of PMTCT drugs in MTCT plus programs. And you can see in blue the drop-off in single-dose nevirapine. You can see the, the increase in dual drug therapy, but we're still far from achieving um, the number of women who should be getting ART. And just to reinforce this yet again, the Pearl study published uh, this week by Elizabeth Stringer and her colleagues presented at, at a number of conferences last year that just shows that even again with our most simple regimens, the drop-off between women who were provided single-dose nevirapine and those in who it could be shown in cord blood that they'd taken it. So there are many slips along the way. There are remaining research questions in PMTCT. Promise, the very large trial planned by IMPACT, will provide many of those answers and will particularly start to investigate whether it's safe to stop triple therapy for prophylaxis or whether it should be continued. I want to move to child health. We know that HIV is closely linked to the failure of many countries to be on track for MDG4. We know that child health outcomes are, are completely affected by the health of the mother and the family, and that maternal illness or death worsens child outcomes and increases child mortality. And that's why we're, we still see AIDS orphans in high prevalence areas. We also know that there's been slow progress in improving access to ART for children in need. HIV is a major cause of death in high prevalence settings. Half of all deaths of children under five occur in sub-Saharan Africa, 
Africa accounts for 90% of HIV infections in children, 90% of HIV-related deaths. And HIV is the underlying cause of one-third of deaths in children under five in the countries of, of sub-Saharan Africa. These are projections from the US uh, Bureau of the Census for this year to show that what uh, under five mortality would look like with or without the impact of HIV. And I think they speak for themselves. South Africa also shows that, and, and in the Every Death Counts study across South Africa, if you look at the number of neonatal deaths from infections, if you look at many of the related conditions, HIV is playing a major role in, um, in child death. We know from the SHER study that early diagnosis and early initiation of treatment in children saves lives that uh, getting children onto care rapidly with, with PCR tests done in the, in the first four to six weeks cuts mortality completely. But we also know that access to, to treatment for children with HIV is less than optimal. We have gone up to just over 355,000 at the end of last year, um, and had, that had increased from 276,000 estimated in 2008. But we know that more children's lives can be saved if treatment has started earlier in line with the new recommendations. And that's partly because of the availability of testing. Expanding the availability of early infant diagnostic testing remains a critical need. WHO is calling for greater access, and without, act, without that diagnosis, without prompt initiation of treatment, one-third of HIV-infected children will die before their first birthday, and half will die before two years. We've seen data presented at this conference from my colleagues at the Africa Center that also shows that treating mothers helps to save babies. And in the work from the Africa Center, the incidence of death by five years of age in children of untreated mothers was 9%, compared to 5% in those whose mothers received therapy. And after adjusting for other risk factors, antiretroviral therapy reduced the risk of children's death by 75%. What can we do in order to achieve this? We know that the effectiveness of our PMTCT programs is probably even more dependent on, on providing access and coverage than it is on the right regimen. Regimens are important, but reaching them is equally so. HIV-infected women need to be identified, the, they must have acceptable interventions, and those interventions must be in place. And they must particularly be in place to prevent breast milk transmission if we are going to achieve success. But prevention of mother-child transmission will fail if we focus only on the narrow role of women and their biological role in transmission. And reaching MDGs 4, 5, and 6, I think, requires a much broader view and much increased coverage of strategies that we know to be effective. We should be measuring indicators beyond just infected children. Have we used the most effective drug combinations? Are we providing them? Were mothers evaluated for the initiation of full and ongoing antiretroviral treatment? This should be as much of an indicator as how many women receive prophylaxis. Are other sexual and reproductive health services being provided? Is family planning in place? Were other members of the family targeted through that woman for the provision of service? Has counseling taken place on infant feeding and on future contraception? And has there been exploration by the caregivers of possible social support services that may be necessary? We need to link PMTCT programs to everything else that goes on around them. I suggested somewhere the other day we should circumcise all the fathers while the mothers were pregnant, but I got a strange reaction from the men. Um, that linkage may be integrated linkage, it may be to, to other services that exist, but either way, we need to link it. And we have to realize, though, that PMTCT does not exist in a vacuum. The resources for treatment are under siege. Nine million treat people worldwide still lack access to ART, and two-thirds of those are in sub-Saharan Africa. Public health decisions on PMTCT programming and regimens need to be made as part of broader country HIV programming. And as we talk of elimination, as we target elimination, as we talk about getting to zero um, and virtually eliminating, I'm not quite sure what the difference is between virtual elimination and elimination. So I think let's aim at elimination um, by 2015. I think we have to think about what that means. UNAIDS, in, in the book that they provide in your conference bag, uh, 
uh, lay some of that out. Virtually eliminating HIV among babies will cost a little over $610 million a year in low- and middle-income countries. But the return on that investment is high. I would say the return on that investment may be priceless, a little bit like the MasterCard ad. Um, if programs go to scale according to plan, the world could avert 2 million child infections between 2009 and 2015. That's our challenge. I hope the next speakers are going to tell us how to do it. Um, and I look forward to hearing how we've achieved it by the next conference. Thank you. Thank you, James, for your very nice presentation and overview of this triangulation between maternal and child health and PMTCT. We know from the developing world where maternal and child health, uh, developed world where maternal and child health services are strong, that PMTCT is mother child transmission virtually eliminated. And let's hope that interventions we do today for prevention of HIV infections in countries with low resource settings will help also to improve maternal and child health and achieve other Millennium Development Goals. With that, I would like to move to our next speaker. I would like to introduce Dr. Nathan Schaffer from World Health Organization Switzerland. Dr. Nathan Schaffer is a leader of PMTCT team in WHO. Uh, he joined WHO one year ago as a PMTCT team leader. In his capacity, he led the revision of PMTCT guidelines uh, he coordinates PMTCT support with other departments and help lead the PMTCT interagency task team. Previously, he led PMTCT gr uh, activities for CDC and PEPFAR and led the uh, regional short course AZT trial in Thailand. Dr. Schaffer, please. Uh, Ruslan, thank you very much. I feel uh, I hope you can hear a little bit better than we could hear on the platform. I feel like we're in a maternal child health clinic somewhere. It's crowded and hot and uh, people screaming all over the place. So uh, maybe some of you are used to this already. Uh, I'm going to give a similar talk to what I gave in the uh, symposium on, symposium on, um, on Monday night, but I hope I have a little bit more time to walk through some of the issues. I think that many of you have picked up uh, the new guidelines for PMTCT and infant feeding. If there, uh, there may still be some in the back, and if not, please, uh, there are still copies at the WHO booth as part of the UN booth, so please um, be sure to pick those up. Uh, in my talk, which uh, I hope that uh, the uh, that you will have a clear idea of what the new PMTCT and infant feeding guidelines are about as an overview, why they are so important and why this is a tremendous opportunity moving forward within the context both of elimination and uh, improving and attaining the MDG goals. So uh, the key messages for the talk are that the new guidelines really represent a major paradigm shift for PMTCT and HIV infant feeding. They provide the normative basis for the elimination of vertical transmission that we're hearing so much about at this conference. But the challenge truly is to implement and scale up new, the, the new highly effective regiments. Uh, James outlined the, uh, the comprehensive issues and the, and the different prongs that are needed in terms of uh, prevention of infection in women and avoiding unintended pregnancies, but for the purposes of this talk on the guidelines, I'll be focusing on the prevention of uh, mother-to-child transmission from an infected pregnant woman to, uh, to the exposed child. Um, while much progress has been made globally as of 2008, uh, really, we've only, by estimates, are only averting relatively few infections from, uh, from nearly 500,000 probable uh, uh, likely infections, we're preventing about 70,000. We think that there will be a significant uh, improvement in this figure as the 2009 calculations are made based on the rapidly expanding coverage. If we're talking about achieving elimination we're, uh, or virtual elimination, we're talking about trying to get down to, uh, at least down to this area of uh, less than 50,000 global infections a year, which would represent a 90% decrease 
in, uh, in, in infections. In November 2009, WHO launched three harmonized or coordinated rapid advice documents, one on adult treatment, one on PMTCT, ARV interventions, and one on HIV and infant feeding. And uh, this was important for several reasons. First of all, the guidelines and other related guidelines, but these in specifically are very much interrelated with each other. Uh, and two, I think the, there was real, a real urgency by the, and excitement by the scientific community to, to rapidly move to new guidelines based on new evidence, and countries that are scaling up programs were really demanding uh, and expecting new and better uh, guidelines as the basis, more effective guidelines for their programs. So there's been tremendous amount of work already based on the release of the rapid advice. At this conference, we've launched the, uh, the full guidelines, and as I mentioned, uh, copies may still be available uh, at the door, the adult treatment guidelines, the PMTCT, and the HIV and infant feeding guidelines. The rationale for developing the new guidelines are, uh, were based on new evidence on what is the best time to start ART interventions in pregnant women, uh, when to start AR, ARV prophylaxis, what are the best ARV prophylaxis strategies, and most importantly, the, uh, the very impressive evidence that emerged since 2006 on the benefit of different prophylaxis strategies uh, to prevent uh, transmission during breastfeeding. I want to remind you that uh, without, without uh, interventions, the risk of transmission uh, is approximately 15 to 45 percent. We use a point estimate of about 30 or 35 percent. It obviously depends on local factors and, most importantly, on breastfeeding. Uh, with, the, with the 2006 guidelines, even on the, under the best of programmatic circumstances, we could expect we were working in the range here in blue of approximately trying to achieve transmission rates of 15 percent at best. And we had tremendous dilemmas in terms of uh, gui guidance on, on breastfeeding and what was safe and what might reduce the, the risk of infection. The new guidelines to jump ahead are clearly targeted at, uh, based on the new evidence, on reducing transmission to less than 5 percent in the presence of breastfeeding and, or, or even lower, and reducing transmission to less than 2 percent uh, without breastfeeding. The guidelines are based on two major principles, and uh, James has alluded to that. Uh, one is lifelong ART for HIV-positive pregnant women in need of treatment, and the second is prophylaxis, or, or the short provision of ARVs to prevent transmission from mother to child for women not eligible for treatment. And this is both during pregnancy and during breastfeeding, if breastfeeding is deemed to be the best and safest uh, option for the child's health. I want to just briefly mention that going into the discussion of the revised guidelines, uh, there's really increasing complexity about the drugs that we're considering using during pregnancy and during the uh, breastfeeding period. So there are a lot of considerations about toxicity, and one of the uh, one of the issues that still makes our guidelines somewhat complex is the different considerations of available drugs that could be used during pregnancy or during, uh, or in, during the breastfeeding period. Ultimately, we would like, of course, to have one simple uh, fixed-dose combination of drugs that could be used for pregnant women, that could be used for women with low CD4 count and high CD4 count, but we're not uh, at that stage yet. Now, for women who are eligible for ART, uh, the basic principle is that women who uh, are eligible should receive ART for their own health for lifelong treatment. And women should be initiated similar to the adult guidelines. Uh, pregnant women should be started and indeed prioritized for ART if their CD4 count is less than or equal to 350, regardless of clinical stage, or if, it, if the CD4 count is not available, if they have clinical stage three or four. ART should be, should be started as soon as feasible. Um, we, we know that CD4 counts or CD4 testing is much more sensitive than clinical staging. So the new guidelines clearly uh, put increased importance and stress the need 
uh, of the critical need of CD4 for decision making on ART eligibility. And there's been important discussion, an exciting discussion here about different strategies to make CD4 counts more available, to do point of, four, uh, point of care CD4 testing, and to, uh, to pursue other, other uh, strategies. So this is a schema of what, uh, what the eligibility for ART uh, looks like in the new guidelines. And here's the schema of uh, the basic table for the ART regimens that are recommended. The first-line regimens are the same as the adult first-line regimens. And what uh, also should be emphasized on this uh, slide is that the mother is receiving ART. The, 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 the exposed infant should also still receive four to six weeks of prophylaxis during the immediate newborn period. Uh, a lot of data supported the new recommendations. This is uh, one set of data from the ZEBS trial that, uh, that James referred to already, showing the, uh, the extraordinarily high uh, risk of transmission and the important contribution of transmission and maternal deaths and postnatal infections in women with low CD4 counts. So the, uh, the guidelines really emphasize the importance of targeting women who are eligible for treatment and treating women lifelong for their own health and for the benefits of interrupting um, uh, maternal, uh, interrupting vertical transmission. Women with CD4 counts less than 350 represent about 40% of HIV pregnant women, account for about 75% of all of the uh, MTCT risk, account for 80% of postpartum transmission, uh, as much as 85% of maternal deaths within two years of delivery. So clearly there will be a very strong benefit from initiating ART for maternal health and PMTCT uh, throughout the course of the pregnancy and postpartum. The second part of the strategy is ARV prophylaxis to prevent mother-to-child transmission. And this is for women who are not eligible for ART or with unknown eligibility. And the new guidelines recommend starting as early as 14 weeks gestation. We're moving the, the start time from 28 weeks, beginning of third trimester, to 14 weeks. We realize that in most settings, women will not be starting at 14 weeks, but we hope that they will be starting sometime during the second trimester. There have been tremendous missed opportunities uh, from the old guidelines of, of uh, women uh, tar targeted to start in the third trimester, but in fact not starting until very late in the third trimester. And, the, and in the new guidelines for prophylaxis, two equivalent options in terms of effectiveness are recommended. Uh, option A, based on maternal AZT, or option B, based on maternal triple ARV prophylaxis. And I'll speak a bit more about those in a minute. And in, what I want you to focus on is that the intervention to the mother uh, must be coupled with an effective intervention during the breastfeeding period. So it's a package. It, it really extends our whole concept of what PMTCT is about. It no longer at all stops PMTCT, uh, which never should have stopped at delivery. But uh, now our interventions and our follow-up certainly do not stop at delivery, but must, uh, must continue throughout the, uh, the follow-up and support and interventions for the exposed child. And again, there is a substantial body of data to support the, uh, the, new, the new recommendations on, uh, on options A and B and prophylaxis. This uh, schema summarizes some of the many studies. Tremendous amount of work was done on extended nivirapine prophylaxis up to six months and ARV triple prophylaxis to mothers. So, so this is the schema that summarizes the two options in the new guidelines. Option A, which starts AZT. Uh, there is a, a recommendation to continue to use single-dose nivirapine and the AZT, AZT 3TC tail, especially if the mother starts the AZT late. Uh, and then the infant will be put on, on daily nivirapine from birth until uh, one week after the end of uh, breastfeeding. Option B is based on one of several different triple ARV uh, prophylaxis regimens, and the mother would continue the triple prophylaxis uh, throughout the, uh, the period of exposure to breastfeeding. The related uh, companion 
guideline, which uh, my colleague Nigel Rollins headed up, is the HIV and infant feeding guideline. And I'm just going to briefly uh, summarize two of, the, uh, two of the considerations here. From a programmatic point of view, the guideline recommends strongly that it's really now up to national programs to decide on the best feeding option for, that, the, that the national program will support. Certainly, individual mothers still need to make a, uh, a choice about infant feeding options, but in terms of program support and uh, general, uh, general support for the bre uh, infant feeding strategies, this should be part of a national program decision and based on the strategy that will most likely give infants the greatest chance of HIV-free survival question of, of how long to breastfeed I think is still going to be a complicated one. The evidence showed that the uh, certainly breastfeeding should continue up until 12 months and then uh, mothers could safely wean from that point. I know that this is going to continue to be a difficult uh, choice in terms of the duration in countries that choose breastfeeding as the, ba as, as the best option. But the ba basic principle would be that prophylaxis should be provided throughout the breastfeeding period. The cost of the regimens is important, and we've heard some very uh, good analyses already of the potential uh, cost benefit and cost savings of the new guidelines strategies. The option A is uh, clearly much, uh, much less expensive than option B. We estimate that right now it costs about $50 for the mother-baby pair. Option B uh, costs approximately $200 to $800, so there's a wide range based on the regimen and the price availability in country. Uh, certainly we hope that these prices will, uh, will come down and this is going to be an important part of the decision making in country. So uh, in terms of the adaptation of guidelines, uh, countries need to face the decision of whether to choose option A or B for prophylaxis. There are advantages and disadvantages of both options in terms of feasibility, acceptability, safety for the mothers, as well as the cost, as I've just mentioned. And this will be important to uh, make this decision at the country level. In this slide, I've just shown a couple of the, of the advantages and disadvantages that might be considered for option A. Clearly, the, there's a cost. Uh, difference for option A. It may be easier uh, for option A, and many countries in, in high burden countries in Africa are choosing option A because essentially it's an incremental increase from the current program of short course AZT uh, plus, uh, plus nevirapine. And so uh, uh, now the AZT is extended antenatally and the nevirapine is extended uh, postpartum. I think, uh, I think we should point out that in areas where, where it is unlikely that women will have access to CD4 testing and many women uh, would, re be, would be receiving prophylaxis instead of treatment because they can't be judged to be on treatment, it's plausible to argue that option B might be more effective in a program setting. So this schema summarizes the, uh, uh, where, where we've moved from uh, uh, from the short course, from the short course strategies of the 2006 guidelines, the darker blue bars show the coverage during the, the periods of risk for the uh, option A and for option B, and emphasizing the importance of maternal triple A or uh, maternal ART treatment for women that are eligible for treatment, covering uh, throughout the risk period for mother to child transmission. In the guidelines, we have a section on research questions because uh, there are not only operational challenges, but there are also important research questions that need to be uh, addressed and answered and hopefully would provide the evidence base towards uh, further revisions of the guidelines that we anticipate in, uh, in a couple of years. I think foremost among these are issues of starting and stopping the triple prophylaxis, the safety of the extended uh, prophylaxis options, the critical issues of the access to CD4 testing, and, uh, and, and, and also the assessment of proposed strategies to provide ART to all HIV-infected pregnant women. There are, as we know, important implementation challenges. I think that we should 
Absolutely. Well, there's been tremendous success in PMTCT programs on, on the entry point of testing and counseling. We still need very much to focus on universal uh, provider-initiated testing and counseling as the entry point. We, we can have the most effective regimens in the world, but if we can't test and identify women in need of the intervention, we will have a, a program of limited effectiveness. I've mentioned the uh, issue of CD4 testing and availability. We've heard uh, uh, James just talk about the integration of PMTCT and maternal child health services. I would just focus at the end on the great importance of enhanced monitoring and evaluation, including impact assessment of the new guidelines. This is an important new opportunity, and my colleague uh, Nigel will be ad addressing this in a lot more detail. Uh, WHO has moved ahead with many partners to provide support for com country implementation of guidelines and, and indeed I want to emphasize again that countries themselves are really providing the leadership and moving ahead quickly to uh, adapt and begin to imp uh, plan for the implementation of the new guidelines. So to summarize, the guiding principles of the new guidelines are that women in need of ART, of AR, AR, ARVs for their own health, should receive lifelong ART, that CD4 count is critical for decision making about ART eligibility, interventions should maximize the reduction of vertical transmission and preserve future treatment options, we need to have a unified view of the antepartum and the postpartum approaches, and uh, different options may be appropriate in different settings. Uh, so, in closing, the revised guidelines, we feel, uh, provide an important opportunity, a very exciting opportunity as we move towards uh, looking to the elimination of mother-to-child transmission. The guidelines provide the new norms and standards for highly effective interventions in resource-limited settings to improve the health of the mother, decrease mother-to-child transmission, and improve HIV-free survival. With the effective implementation of these guidelines, transmission clearly can be reduced to less than 5% in breastfeeding populations and less than 2% in non-breastfeeding populations. And the guidelines and the effective program implementation will indeed make an important contribution towards the elimination of pediatric HIV. So I'd like to thank uh, 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 my, my colleagues at WHO, uh, the many uh, UN partner agencies that provided support, and most importantly, the uh, expanded IATT partners and the countries and uh, ministries of health that are uh, actively working on, that had input into the guidelines and are actively working on implementation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nathan. We have time for two questions from the audience. No questions? Okay. okay, please. Thank you both for wonderful presentations and for your inspiration throughout. I wonder how uh, assessment of survival of women is going to be carried out when we have no baseline data available. The longest uh, maternal survival data that we have is Dr. Kuhn's data, as far as I know, from Africa. We have none in the developed world. And I would just mention our poster from this meeting in the, uh, about our experience in the Bronx, where we found that seven-year survival uh, was 75% in a resource-rich setting in, with women with lots and lots of visits to the doctor. We don't know what the sources are, what the um, reasons are, but we do know that we don't know and I'd like to hear of implementation of just assessing where we are right now. Thank you. One more question, please. Um, I'm Lorraine Scher from London. I'd like to ask a question about compounds that permeate the blood-brain barrier. We do know in adults where there's um, HIV, dementia, and cognitive delay, um, that that's really important. Is anyone looking at that in children? and in pregnancy. I'll take one more question from the gentleman from the back. Uh, I think, thank you uh, again for an exciting presentation and the paradigm, uh, the paradigm shift, but 
one of the things you mentioned in the paradigm, both speakers, was primary prevention, uh, which is absolutely a critical part, whether there is any really reports, whether there is any trend downwards, and how that's going to be monitored parallel to the, uh, the paradigm shift we are preaching. And the last question. Yeah, it, it's a very quick question. Um, just to Nathan, you mentioned when you were discussing option A versus option B. Option A, I think, is the, is the, is the single uh, AZT and then extended nevirapin for the baby during breastfeeding. You mentioned that for, in order, to, and while option B is the triple ARV prophylaxis, you mentioned that option B requires CD4 testing. But I, I think option A requires CD4 testing also in order to sort out uh, those women who require therapy. Uh, rather than prophylaxis. Maybe you could just clarify that point. Thanks very much. Thank you. Nathan? Uh, thanks. For, fortunately, I, I wrote those questions down a little bit because I don't remember any of them. But let me, let me work backwards. Uh, first, maybe I misspoke a little bit. I, I know what I was trying to say. Clear, Tim, you're a absolutely right. Uh, uh, to decide on prophylaxis, the whole idea with the guidelines is that option A and option B are for women that are not eligible for ART, and that's premised primarily on the CD4 count. What I was trying to say was that in the setting where, where women are not effectively assessed for eligibility, then option B, arguably in a program setting, might have more effectiveness because it will be uh, providing uh, a triple of a, a suppressive regimen uh, for women that have low CD4 counts. Uh, in terms of the paradigm shift with primary prevention, that's a, a great question. We've had other sessions that are looking and emphasizing on prevention, and we heard a plenary on combination, um, combination prevention this morning. I think that uh, uh, we need, in the PMT, broader than the PMTCT area, we really need more focus on what are the effective strategies that are actually going to be decreasing the numbers of uh, infected young women uh, who may ultimately become pregnant. That's much more than what the PMTCT program can take on. There are effective strategies um, with partner testing, male testing, uh, working with discordant couples, and trying to do primary prevention uh, in settings where there's enough capacity for women that test HIV negative. After all, pregnant women are the largest group that are routinely being tested. It's a tremendous missed opportunity not to intervene with more effective prevention strategies for women that test negative as opposed to just uh, a 30 second or a three second uh, in information. But I think that we need to uh, focus on that as the speaker suggested. We also need to have better data. I'm actually not so sure that we even really know what are the trends in countries. And this is an opportunity as we move in the next five years towards the goal of elimination to really look at the number, and in different age groups, particularly young women, at the numbers and the trends of uh, prevalence and, and uh, to some degree incidence of, uh, of HIV infection in women so that we can focus on the prevention efforts. We sh certainly hope that the overall denominator is going down as we hope that our effectiveness of programs is going up. On the question of the compounds in the blood-brain barrier, uh, there was a very nice session yesterday on pharmacovigilance and uh, very uh, important presentations by the antiretroviral um, uh, registry, pregnancy registry, on, on long-term uh, monitoring uh, of, uh, of the effect of different compounds during pregnancy and, uh, and postpartum. And I think that the, one of the messages from that, from that session was that we need enhanced pharmacovigilance as new products are, um, are introduced. Clearly, if we're talking about longer-term effects, in later developments of children, then that's going to prevent, uh, that's going to present big challenges. I know that there are long-term cohorts that have been set up in the U.S. and some other developed countries, uh, but that's, that's a big, uh, a big challenge, but we need to be thinking about that and look for any potential uh, signals to trigger our focus of interest. On the issue of um, maternal, um, maternal mortality, I might ask, uh, 
uh, James or, or Nigel perhaps to, to comment um, on that. I think that Karen, you pointed out rightly that we really have very limited, limited data in terms of maternal uh, health and survival. One of the opportunities among many of the new guidelines with the follow-up and the expectation of follow-up of the mothers and babies is that it provides us the opportunity at least first with short, short follow-up of mothers and to help that transition into care so that strategically we can begin to think about the, uh, the follow-up of mothers. There's been so much talk about the MDGs, but we need to develop strategies for how are we going to get the, the real data. And James, do you want to add? I think just to agree and to agree with Karen that we, we don't have data. Um, and antiretroviral treatment started, started in pregnancy is absolutely novel to most of these high prevalence countries. Uh, we don't have women in general in long term follow up and so I think it's something that you raise a really good point that we need to collect the data and start to see what's happening. Thank you. Thank you. Nathan. I would like to introduce the speaker for the next presentation on pregnancy, HIV, and drug use. It's a very exciting topic. We don't hear about that very often in the, in the usual PMTCT circle. So I think that's a very important presentation by uh, Dr. Gabriele Fischer. She is a professor for psychiatry and neuro neurology at the University in Vienna since 1994. She's a medical director of the Addiction Clinic. She's involved in various scientific studies in the field of substance use disorders. Substance dependence during pregnancy become, has become her special research focus. She's a consultant and a very valuable resource person for several international and national institutions, inclu including UNODC, which is the United Nations Office on Drug and Crime, the World Health Organization, and the European Parliament. Gabriela, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. As I'm one of the few Viennese people being actively involved in this uh, major meeting here, I want to give you a special welcome in Vienna and I also want to refer that it's not only the AIDS conference, we have it now, we also, it's also the place where Sigmund Freud used to work and Sigmund Freud also had a lot of experiences by himself and wrote a lot of essays in regard to the dangerous and the features of drugs. I want to thank very much um, UNICEF and WHO for inviting me to be part of this panel. And uh, I will actually start off with the topic of addiction. I had, there was a very interesting uh, presentation in the morning in the key lecture looking into the prevention of mother-child transmission. And I felt kind of embarrassed because the word of addiction and drugs never was mentioned. And you will see, if you do not know so far, what I don't think is one of the key reasons why there is a high mother-child transmission. And if you not consider addiction as a severe disease and treat this disease, we, we, we will lose the battle of reducing uh, the uh, transmission rate uh, for the neonates. This is very, very well known to the audience here the figures of how many HIV infections do we have worldwide. We find here uh, the figures about 50 million uh, HIV infected women, 1.6 million gave birth to children, and 0.4 million children were born with HIV. And just to picture you the dimension of addiction, we find here the data, we have 1 billion suffering on tobacco dependence, 2 billion on alcohol, and if you take an average range of the illicit drugs from cocaine, amphetamines to opiates, it adds up to about 50 million worldwide. And opioids are the major drug where shooting heroin is the, one of the major reasons why women get infected with um, HIV. You find here very interesting ratio between women and males suffering on substance dependence disorder. 
Ten years ago, it was a ratio of four to one. Now we got this ratio, it's about two to one. Now the women are actually increasing in the figures of suffering on addiction. It used to be about 10 years ago, a key publication in science pointing that addiction is a brain disorder and this matters. And the most effective treatment approach, as in many psychiatric diseases, includes biological, behavioral, and social context, context treatment approaches. And this actually, this approaches from biological, behavioral, and social context relates as well to the context of treating HIV AIDS. We also have to bear in mind that addiction is a chronic relapsing disorder with high somatic and high psychiatric comorbidities. And addiction and the treatment course of uh, the treatment of substance dependence does not differ to any other chronic disorder. It's no difference to diabetes, hypertension, or asthma. So we also have to keep this in mind. We talk about a chronic relapsing disorder. And if we move on now to a healthy pregnancy, what are the ingredients? Good genetics. We do know that in our population, very often there is already a genetics loading of substance dependence. We do know that there's a high heritability. And still some people think, do you have to just say no? That's actually the wrong approach. And if you're not facing the issue of a chronic relapsing disorder, we are unable to treat this condition sufficiently. And we would need all the other ingredients to have a healthy pregnancy. So the field is broad. If you look in our target population of the injecting heroin uh, dependent women who are pregnant. If you're not treating addiction, there is ongoing shooting. It's putting the high risk on the pregnant women. There is a lot of infection. It's HIV, it's hepatitis C, and many, many more infectious disease. And these women are going to be exposed extendedly very often to a violent environment. So we know by now that about 30% of the opiate-dependent women are in the childbearing age. We do have improved treatment approaches for a long, long time. We do know, and this is quite different from publication to publication, about 30% and higher of high HIV infections are related to IV drug use and to undertreatment of the possible opioid maintenance therapy in many areas. And what is very, very interesting for our treatment, opioids are not teratogenic. So we actually can treat these women with opioids like methadone and buprenorphine. And what we also have to bear in mind, that about 50% of our target group is having a codependent and very often a co-infected partner. So we have to treat, of course, both of them. And what I think is very obvious, that we not only have opiate-dependent people, or women, pregnant women in, who are infected, they use many, many other drugs. And what we have to be actually very careful, we have to treat them adequately, as pointed out now with antiretroviral treatment, and what kind of drug-drug interactions are going to be occurring with our medication we offer for the treatment of addiction. Continuously, we need to think how is actually the outcome in regard to developmental aspects. This is a slide pointing you out. It's from the Lancet, which is actually um, um, ava was available here. The rate of the proportion of ID users in Russia, China, Ukraine, Vietnam, Malaysia in relation to the percentages of uh, HIV infections. You see these high figures, and unfortunately, you find these very low figures of having access to antiretroviral treatment. Keep this graph in mind, because I'm going to be showing how low the treatment of addiction in these areas is. There is general consensus between WHO, UNODC, and UNAIDS that maintenance opioid substitution therapy is the standard of care for treating opioid addiction and for preventing HIV in ID drug abusers. 
We don't have many medication, but we have some medication for a long, long time, like methadone. Methadone actually has been first published in 1965, and it's the common standard that for opioid-dependent pregnant women, methadone is the role model of medication for the adequate treatment. This has been pointing out by key people in the US, advocates, Robert Newman, Mary Ching Greek, Loretta Finnegan. There's a lot of evidence that this is a, the standard of care in pregnancy. In Europe, we increased the methadone coverage. In the world, actually, you can read this very well, is Australia and Spain. But you see here, China actually increased very nicely. And why made the world available this medication? Because of HIV. And I recently was in China. It's delightful to see that opiate-dependent HIV-positive pregnant women are on methadone and antiretroviral treatment. This is the graph I was referring to you, that this is again the proportion of, um, of ID drug users and the very, very small proportion you see what is available on opioid agonistic treatment for them in these areas. Even we thought it's very low the antiretroviral treatment available, but this is this, we are very, very unhappy that Russia has never been moving in watching these increasing figures in the population. Opioid maintenance therapy makes a lot of uh, advantages in HIV-positive women. We can actually not only provide the medication, it's going to be a comprehensive counseling towards addiction, towards harm reduction, towards uh, antiretroviral treatment, and also towards drug-drug interaction. As detoxification would be the ideal goal, but it's not possible, and it's not the recommended approach during pregnancy, and not even if you have an infected pregnant woman. There are other drugs, buprenorphine. WHO just released about a year ago that uh, buprenorphine and methadone are the standard care of medication also in uh, pregnant women. We do not have that many data on buprenorphine. It works similar to methadone, but it seems to be very, very beneficial for these women. And again, we can administer this during pregnancy because it's a non teratogenic uh, medication. There are some research controlled trials in buprenorphine. As we have learned, and this question was pointed out right now, I, being a drug researcher, I'm jealous. I see the necessity that there is antiretroviral treatment available in, in HIV-positive pregnant women. But for us in the, in, the, in the psychiatric world or using other drugs, we do need to prove the evidence that it's a curse, that it does not have side effects. And we even are looking in the neuropsychological development of the neonates in children. So there are many, many studies in the meantime who show us that also buprenorphine is a safe medication. And it used to be a, an issue, the cost factor over a long time. But more and more generic uh, products are available for developing country. So it is not either methadone or buprenorphine. It's we finally have methadone and buprenorphine as efficient medication to treat opioid-dependent pregnant women. We do have very rare data, data so far on the interaction between antiretroviral treatment and um, this medication. We are quite nicely educated in regard to methadone. We do know that we need to increase the dosing, we need to double the, uh, to divide the dosing, but it seems to be that buprenorphine acts a similar way. So, opioid maintenance works, it reduces death, reduces drug use, reduces HIV risk, and saves money. And it's cheap. Like, this is the area when I have been um, consulting in Eastern Europe, many of the, our patients are in prison, even pregnant women. This is a very, very uh, 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 expensive place to be, 
and it's usually not the adequate treatment. Breastfeeding, yes, you can breastfeeding uh, on, on buprenorphine and methadone, but it's basically, as Nathan pointed out, it's, it's the basic re recommendation is not to breastfeed, except there are some promising study, like recently in the New England Journal of Medicine from Malawi, where there is no other access to nutrition, that under a special medication, there is a, uh, uh, a low transversion rate. I'm coming to show you some data, and I'm really grateful that UNICEF and WHO are having this topic covered. To just to impress you uh, what high risk factor it is if you're not treating opiate addiction in this HIV positive pregnant women. These are, these are all tables referring to HIV pregnant women. And I'm not going to be going over every detail, I'm just pointing out uh, important things. This is a study from the US. HIV positive women in pregnancy, 30% have been using drugs. This is a study again from the US looking uh, into the ad adherence and then the availability of antiretroviral treatment uh, during pregnancy and um, after delivery. And you see here, prior to the study, about 40% were using illicit, between 30 and 40% were using illicit drugs. You find another study from Europe looking into the, uh, the rate of, uh, of women uh, being HIV positive and pregnant and drug history. 42% have a positive drug history. And now I show you some slides from the European Collaborative Study looking into some uh, European countries and Ukraine looking in, in, uh, in um, HIV testing, in intravenous drug users, and in non-drug users. You see before pregnancy and over the years. You think that testing is getting better over the years, but if you focus on this, here are the non-intravenous drug users and here are the drug users. You see that 71% of the non-drug dependent patients had their HIV test in the beginning in order to improve the outcome, whereas only 47%. And quite about, almost a quarter is realizing at delivery that they are HIV positive. The same is the accessibility of having appropriate treatment. You see here, 19% of the drug using group did not have treatment during pregnancy, whereas 7% in the non IU drug users. And HART was available double as often to the non intravenous drug users. So it's a highly under focus, under treatment in this population. And again, if you, if you look at the outcome of premature delivery and low birth weight, you see that the, that the ideal drug users are on a significantly higher risk of preterm delivery, what means not having the adequate antiretroviral treatment during uh, delivery and having the worst outcome in preterm deliveries. Okay, um, there is some studies, and I want to point out from this sample on Ukrainian women. This was one uh, uh, follow-up study where actually Dr. Ruslan is having been following this, uh, this group for, uh, for many, many years. And you see here, just to point out, between the drug users and the non do drug users, the, transversion, uh, the transmission rate is double as high in the intravenous, not treated drug using group. What is the model? The model is to have comprehensive care. This is my clinic here in Vienna. We have an interdisciplinary group. We also do the, the neuropsychological testing in the neonates and children up to the age of six, and having, of course, the different disciplines. And the, the infectious disease is an integral part of it. But being connected to all the facilities around Vienna is equally important to have the transfer of these women. At the end, I want to probably point out, being a researcher, what would be interesting? If you do research in pregnant women, there are very, very high ethical standards to do this. What would be interesting is adding the impact of HIV into the opiate-dependent group, uh, like we did with an NIH-funded study 
between buprenorphine and methadone, and looking into the HIV medication, how is the pharmacokinetics, how is the pharmacodynamics over this stage of the pregnancy. So, I hope I, I was able to, to jump you into the, the, the necessity of focusing on drug addiction and the treatment, and we can change these outcomes by understanding addiction and providing the comprehensive services that are needed for pregnant women, their infants exposed to drugs and HIV in utero. I thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Gabriela. Um, I would like to invite you to maybe to invite the audience to take, we can take one question while Nigel is preparing to set up his slides. So do you have any questions for Gabriela um, on this topic? Thank you very much for a wonderful uh, talk. I have experience in the United States uh, working with pregnant women with uh, many addiction problems. And I think you kind of skirted past the issue that relapse is much more likely in the absence of psychiatric intervention. And I'd just like to observe that most HIV providers are uncomfortable giving psychiatric medication or evaluation, and that most psychiatrists are very reluctant to give adequate psychiatric therapy to pregnant women, and that this is a real problem. Thanks. Well, I completely agree, and therefore I just really want to focus again on the interdisciplinary cooperation, especially in this high-risk group of patients. Thank you very much. I would like to uh, introduce you to the next presentation on measuring the impact of prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV. Uh, Nigel Rowlands uh, joined the Department of Child and Adolescent Health and Development of WHO in July 2008. Before joining WHO, uh, Nigel was professor and head of the Center for Maternal Child Health at the University of KwaZulu-Natal in Durban, South Africa, where he lived and worked for 14 years. His work focuses primarily on prevention of mother-to-child transmission of HIV through infant feeding, but also works on health systems research and severe malnutrition. Nigel, over to you. Thanks very much indeed, Ying, and uh, thank you for staying. It's, uh, it's a hot day, and uh, you'll have realized by now that I'm not South African. Uh, my Irish roots are, are probably giving way, and I'm perspiring rather a lot up here. So. It, if I suddenly take off my shirt, which my kids would do in this weather, you can blame the organizers, okay? Um, so measuring the impact of PMTCT programs. Um, this is a slide taken from a preliminary version of a document prepared by WHO on monitoring and evaluating uh, prevention of mother-to-child transmission uh, programmers. And monitoring and surveillance uh, is very, very important but it's different from impact assessments. And so while the day-to-day -day monitoring of what we do on the ground is critical, uh, there is a difference between that and what I want to talk about today, namely impact assessments. So when we talk about impact, we use these data to evaluate the overall effectiveness of interventions. And so I want to sort of set the stage of what we're going to be talking about. These numbers, these one or two numbers, are very often used for advocacy, for political purposes, for a whole range of uh, reasons uh, that are quite distinct and different from the day-to-day -day monitoring that goes on within. It needs to tell the bottom line. It may not always tell the reasons why, but it needs to tell the bottom line. So I went and had a look at all the, the posters that have been presented on PMTCT and looking at what has been presented as impact of PMTCT interventions and programs. And there's a whole series of reports about process or output data. The PMTCT cascade, the slide that uh, I think Nathan or James put up earlier from um, uh, Elizabeth uh, Stringer on the Pearl study, showing how the numbers drop over time in each of the various steps. We've seen that time and again. We're starting to see now a number of non-HIV indicators of the impact of HIV on other services. We're seeing the health system effects being reported. 
We're seeing immunisation rates, for example, being reported as a proxy of what happens uh, whenever HIV interventions are implemented within routine services. But what we want to get to are the real outcomes. And by that we talk about, for the infants, transmission rates, number of infants infected annually, transmissions averted, and as Nathan was mentioning, HIV-free survival. And I have to say now that the majority of what I'm going to talk about is on the infant outcomes. Um, but the point raised earlier about maternal outcomes is desperately important. What we do have at the moment are some data on mortality among HIV-infected mothers. Other ways of putting it are the proportion of maternal deaths attributable to HIV and the life expectancy of HIV-infected mothers. And this is one uh, set of data that were reported in the Women and Health Report by the WHO in 2009, illustrating that globally HIV is the leading cause of death among women of reproductive age. We see this being reflected in maternal mortality trends. And the data that James showed earlier from South Africa and the quote that he had from the recent publication in The Lancet, although he, he referenced uh, the quote by Koresha, one of the other striking points in that article was just the absolute dearth of information and data about what happens to women over time when they become pregnant and their long-term survival. And the main issue is that we need to have more data on what happens to women as they become mothers and as they, uh, they survive beyond pregnancy. For children, the global impact of ART and PMTCT scale-up has been reported in a number of different ways. This is the estimate of the annual number of infections averted. So this is the, what we're trying to achieve, 70,000, as Nathan mentioned. We're still seeing over 400,000 new infections still happening each year. And so these things are largely modelled data rather than counted on the ground. Transmission rates are the usual way by which we estimate and uh, determine the effectiveness or the impact of what we're trying to do in the ground. This was a report from uh, Cape Town on the effectiveness of a, of a district-wide program for mother-to-child transmission. And they reported, which was very good at that time, a transmission rate of 8.8%. But if you read into the paper, you realize that there were 658 women enrolled into that program in that particular period of time. There was only transmission rates estimated in 410 of those children. And that you had an 8.8% in that one subgroup. So what happened to the other third of children? Was the program really succeeding? Because if we simply look at transmission, then there's a problem, particularly in this type of a, of a way. The DREAM study was a multi-country study where, again, very, very admirable results. We see very low transmission rates, and it was concluded that ART is effective. ART is unquestionably effective, but it doesn't tell us about the effectiveness or the impact of the program on populations. So there are several challenges and limits on using infant transmissions as a measure of PMTCT effectiveness. You have problems with sampling bias, in that it only measures those children who are actually brought back to services. You may omit infants of mothers who become infected after the first test. They're not known to the services. Those who never attend ANC are never recognized. Modeled approaches do not necessarily reflect real-life non-adherence. The new guidelines, as Nathan presented, really illustrate the, the exceptional opportunity that we have at the moment to do things very much better. And for that reason, the impact of what our efforts need to achieve become even more important to be able to measure. And so I would, I would say that as a single indicator or target, transmission rates alone do not reflect what we want to measure. They don't tell us about maternal health, survival, the benefits of, of interventions, it doesn't tell us about the success or failure of identifying and initiating treatment on infected infants and their improved survival. And it doesn't tell us anything about the potential of improving survival in the general population if infants are able to safely breastfeed. So another way of looking at the problem or telling the story. These were data uh, presented early in the week, um, trying to understand what has been the impact of PEPFAR uh, on uh, PMTCT outcomes in rele relevant countries. And they reported on infant mortality rates in focus countries against elsewhere, and they, they demonstrated a reduction in infant mortality, and there's some um, issues there. And under five mortality, we see a similar story. 
we saw the data that James was referring to earlier from the Africa Centre showing a reduction in under two mortality, and they have now at this conference reported an under five mortality impact. And this was in the context of comprehensive programmes offering ART both to mothers, ARVs for preventing, and also largely breastfeeding practices. This is another population-based uh, set of data from another country in another program in Southern Africa, which has comprehensive ART, ARV prophylaxis, and you see that in the past eight to 10 years, there's been a 50% increase in both infant and child mortality in a setting where formula feeding is the default practice amongst the vast majority of women. But their transmission rates are less than 5%. So are we having the impact that we would want to see there? And in Uganda, again, a population-based estimate, amongst women who were receiving antiretroviral therapy in their children, 97% of the infants were tested and none were infected. So we had, the program had completely succeeded in getting less than 5%, for example. But they found that there was a six times increase in mortality amongst the infants that were being formula-fed than we're being breastfed in the same program. And this is another way of presenting data on mortality. These are from the, the UN AIDS estimates that in Southern Africa we've seen a, a modest decrease in the HIV associated or attributable death amongst children from about 17% down to 14%, which is a good sign, but is it enough? And this slide also demonstrates something else that in countries where HIV prevalence is low, the, simply using the proportion of deaths that are due to HIV will never be seen. You'll never see the benefit of your intervention if it is expressed simply as a fraction of all. So there are challenges on simply trying to interpret mortality as a measure of effectiveness as well. Demographic surveillance systems like the Africa Centre reflect population effects, that's the universal coverage that we're after, but they cannot be generalised as a measure of national impact because you don't know whether that, that particular environment is true everywhere. You can look at demographic health surveys as, national, as reflecting the national story, but they're difficult to uh, repeat on a regular and frequent basis in order to assess progress. They're only done every four, five, six years. And the prevalence of HIV in the population will influence whether HIV-reflected HIV mortality will ever contribute significantly to national mortality rates. So we get back to the problem that HIV-free survival, which is what we're really after, to have children of mothers known to be infected survive while remaining HIV uninfected, that's our priority, but it's hard to assess. So now we say, well, what should an impact assessment be able to do? It's got to be meaningful. So it's really got to tell the story that we want to understand. It's got to be measurable, and HIV-free survival is difficult to measure. It's got to be population-based because we're wanting to understand, are we achieving universal coverage? It's got to be robust. It may not tell us the precision that we find in research studies, but it's good, got to be good enough so that over time we can see trends towards progress or regression. It's got to be replicable within reasonable timelines, both within country or within district health systems, and between countries to make those comparisons. And it's got to be relevant for both high and low prevalence settings. UNICEF convened a meeting last year on trying to understand uh, methods for evaluating, and they concurred that identifying HIV-free survival was the best thing, but it was hard to achieve. The PEARL study, as mentioned earlier, they used a novel way of looking at cord blood samples to understand transmission across all births, but it doesn't really go beyond what happens at birth. And transmission rates in the presence of... They also measured transmission rates in presence of nevirapine as a particular output of PMTCT programs. One other uh, block of work that I just want to uh, go through briefly used immunization clinics as a way of accessing children, first of all to assess six-week HIV prevalence rates, and secondly to estimate trends in infant mortality rates. And the assumption was that if there is high attendance at six-week immunization clinics, then this would be a proxy and good enough to understand what's happening in the full population. And what they did was that they took dried blood spots from every single child coming to the clinic. They tested the dried blood spots for antibodies, 
where there was antibody present, it reflected maternal prevalence and exposure. They then did HIV DNA PCR on those same samples where there was antibody present, and so they were able to calculate vertical transmission rates essentially against a population. And recently they conducted this amongst 347 clinics. They interviewed 38,000 women, and they took information about all their other children and were able to reconstruct infant mortality rates. And then they had 8,000 dried blood samples from children who were specifically six weeks old, and interestingly that this was funded through the Global Fund. So this is just to illustrate what these data can tell you and the sort of inferences that you can take. And this was done at district level. They had 8,000 blood samples. That 3,237 of them demonstrated antibody, which means a 40% maternal prevalence rate, which is very, very consistent with the rest of the national data. They then said, of these 3,000 samples where antibody was present, how many were DNA PCR positive? And they found that there was a 7% transmission rate overall those children. And that they were able to break it down by district. And interestingly, in one district, which was actually in the most rural district, it was 4.4%. And in the, in the urban environment, it was 10%. And this really reflects the, either the functionality or the dysfunctionality of those health systems. And this has proven to be very, very powerful data within the local uh, provincial health system. They were able to break it down by uh, maternal PMTCT regimen. A simple question to ask mothers, what did you take? They were able to look at infant mortality rates and they reconstructed these amongst those 35,000 interviews. And they had seen that in children of these mothers who had been born early, that the infant mortality rates were 26 and that over the about a 10-year period, there had been a trebling of infant mortality rate, which is a very powerful story for advocacy. And whenever they broke that down by district, they were able to see differences as well. They applied the same methodology to a community-based evaluation, 4,200 households visited, to understand, because as a process, you don't know whether you're missing people that are important. The number of children that were evaluated less than 18 months, there was 889 um, uh, children who had samples taken uh, where there was an evaluable blood spot. And there was a 6.6 .6 overall prevalence rate um, in that uh, population, which was very consistent with the clinic data. And they found that there was an infant mortality rate of 67 per thousand. 36% of those deaths occurred at home. So going back to the, our starting point, what can we use and what can be used in different prevalence settings? And I really just want to leave you with one or two thoughts. Infant mortality, if we were, and I think it is very possible to do it, if we looked at 12-month mortality in infants that are HIV exposed, we can come up with a target uh, that I think is meaningful and that is robust to measure and that will tell us about the impact of both transmission and also uh, the effect of maternal health and interventions to keep her well and breastfeeding. Coupled with information about transmission rates, those two data provide a very powerful assessment of the effectiveness of ARVs. In terms of maternal health, a presentation earlier today uh, at the Kesha Bora reported on AIDS-free survival. And I think for mothers this is something that we should be looking at to understand what is the impact of these interventions on mothers. Uh, and I think as, a, as a something that we should be really pressing to try and achieve. And this is important in terms of money, because money counts and it's what a lot of things are evaluated by. If our investment in all the systems and drugs to deliver these interventions is only measured in terms of transmissions averted, then we grossly underestimate the investment. We underestimate the investment in terms of maternal health, we underestimate the benefit in terms of being able to make breastfeeding safer, and we, under, we underestimate the value of the interaction between maternal survival and child survival. And it strengthens the argument and justification for investment as a contribution to MDGs 4 and 5. So in conclusion, impact assessments need to reflect the full scope of what PMTCT aims to achieve. We need robust, simple, combined methods, uh, but we need the investment to perform these. We need these assessments to be repeated in order to monitor progress and to hold ourselves accountable for the investments that are either made or needed. And lastly, just to comment that WHO is developing a protocol for some of these uh, procedures. Many thanks.
Thank you very much, uh, Nigel. Um, we are at four o'clock. Uh, I would still like the organizers to permit us one or two questions uh, to the presenters. So um, please identify yourself uh, if you have a question. Karen Beckerman, again from New York City. Uh, wonderful talk and really inspiring. And um, I would still like to ask you a same question I asked you a year ago. Are there any data of the use of single-dose uh, nevirapine in the field, in a community, or in a region that shows increased uh, HIV-free infant survival? Thank you. Next question. Hi, I'm Saeed Ahmed from Malawi. I think it's really important to understand the overall impact of PMTCT interventions, but it'd also be nice to see what are the problems with individual pieces of the cascade on a program setting, on a national setting, rather than just in studies. And so I'm curious about your thoughts. I think one of the central challenges is linking mothers and babies um, and being able to document that. And so how we might address that and what are the strategies to sort of measure that. Sorry, sorry. Okay, last question, Kevin. Um, Kevin de Cox, CDC. Uh, Nigel, thanks for a very thoughtful, very thoughtful presentation. But in the current climate of sort of gen of spreading out from you know just HIV and just PMTCT and intermediates four and five, I wonder whether, I mean, just to play devil's advocate, whether you're you know in a world where even basic vital registration of births and deaths is missing and you know, is absent in many countries, whether what you're proposing is too complicated. Because at the end of the day, even in very heavily affected countries or moderately heavily affected countries, the proportion of HIV attributable deaths in children is, 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 you know, is low. There are other things contributing. And I wonder whether we're in fact not better to go for special studies that are cheap, you know, less expensive and less labor intensive to get some of that information that we require for HIV while putting more investment in systems that across the board are so, so fragile or even not there at all. I mean, actually in terms of rights, of human rights, the most extraordinary thing is that you can be born and die and never appear in any official document, which is actually quite remarkable. Um, thank you very much indeed for those uh, questions. I, I'd have to say that at a I, I'm pretty confident to say that there are no reports on HIV-free survival uh, in, in a program level where nivirapine has been implemented. And the reason I say that is that outside of research settings, uh, I don't know any data uh, or any programs that have reported, for example, 18-month HIV-free survival because it requires cohorts to be established and followed up over a prolonged period of time, and that's the fundamental problem of it. So uh, I think that, you know, single-dose nevirapine, uh, you know, 10 years ago we were celebrating having something to reduce transmission by 50%. Whenever the microbicide data were presented yesterday, as the authors were coming up on stage, people were applauding. When the results were presented, they were applauding. It was the same response as whenever things happened with nivirapine 10 years ago or longer than that, 15 years ago. So uh, I think in that sense, um, the biggest limitation, as with the maternal data, is that we have no way methodologically of determining HIV-free survival, even if that is the gold standard of whether we are doing the right thing or not. And for that reason, I think we need to look at proxies of HIV-free survival. And that's why I was saying a simple way of determining transmission early and infant mortality at 12 months, either in the general or in the HIV-exposed children, I think is, for me, if I was a program manager or a minister of health, I think those two numbers I would be very satisfied with. The second uh, question about needing to understand the steps, I can't agree more, but it's different from what, uh, if you have a, a, a minister of health or if you have five minutes with a minister of health, they, don't want to, they won't understand the cascade. They won't know the cascade. What they will want to know, which is exactly what happened with this data from KZN, when they saw with the very first assessment in 2004, 2005, that transmission rates were sitting at 
they just said, we need to do something. When the same data, 20.8, was presented to the local community leaders, they just said, we need to do something. A single number is very powerful in terms of advocacy. It's not a substitute, and it doesn't tell you the reasons why, but it is the number in terms of an impact uh, uh, that is needed. It's not the same thing as what you're referring to, uh, and I agree that they are needed. And Kevin, thanks for the last point. The one, one thing I would say is that births and deaths registrations is, uh, I mean, it is an absolute necessity if we want to see public health improved across the system. Forget HIV, can't agree more. The assessments that I referred to were special assessments. They were not dependent, and those data from KwaZulu Natal were not um, from uh, standard uh, birth registrations. Those were special exercises conducted. The last one in those 347 clinics was conducted over a 12 month period. And interestingly, they used essentially community health workers who were extensively trained to collect that mortality data. But to me, to see infant mortality rates collected by that, they may be out by some points here and there, but they tell the story of HIV in those communities uh, that I think is, is very compelling. Um, and I would say that if that particular exercise were conducted again in two years' time, infant mortality rates should be very, very responsive to the interventions that Nathan described earlier on. And my excitement would be in two years' time to repeat that specific survey um, and to see whether we've made an impact because then I think in terms of moving towards MDGs, we would have a, a real cause for celebration. What I, the last comment I would say is that uh, so, you know, we need to remember settings where HIV is not the dominant cause. Um, HIV accounts for 17, 20% of all child mortality in southern, the most heavily affected countries. Globally, it represents 2%. In all of Africa, it represents 4%. So contextualizing that, whereas for maternal health, HIV is the leading cause. Thank you very much for staying with us uh, at this advanced time of the day. I will refrain from concluding remarks and wish you a good rest of the day. Goodbye. <laughs>